Hi, welcome back. I'm Dr. Stephanie C. Holmes. And again, I apologize for some low tech today. Um, the individual who helps me with my YouTube content and my podcast content is also a missionary. And that is his primary job in ministry. So um, I'm attempting a low tech version um, to get some YouTubes up and some content available for you because I've been having people reach out and saying, hey, there hasn't been some new um, content up. A little bit of what I'm going to be sharing. Um, and because I'm in front of a green screen, I've got to be careful. I'll put it in front of my face here for a moment. It is Living from the Heart that Jesus Gave You um, by Friesen and Wilder and others. And so some of the material that I'm going to be talking about today comes from this book. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about um, the double empathy problem. So um, first, let me kind of share what that is. And then we can talk a little bit about what that means in a neurodiverse marriage. So um, recently I had submitted some research to a new journal that was coming out that was focusing on the concept of neurodiversity. And um, as I presented some of my findings, um, my research was accepted provisionally, as long as I didn't say anything negative about neurodiversity in marriage. And so there were things that were asked not to report. Now, there are some things that, it was at, that I was asked to look up, which I absolutely will talk about the double empathy problem and communication that is between two neurodivergent individuals and then between two neurotypical individuals. But I, I felt like it was not honest um, to say that there were not additional challenges in a neurodiverse marriage um, because theory of mind and this double empathy problem is um, a big issue to consider when you're um, in a neurodiverse relationship or you're working with neurodiverse marriage. So first let's kind of look at, at what is the double empathy. So I have my notes um, to keep me on track so I can quote um, the person correctly. Um, but this comes from um, some research by a person by the name of Milton. This is back in 2012. And so um, here's some things that are noted that um, while theory of mind is something that's really important to understand um, in the conversation about autism and neurodiverse marriages. And so if you want to know a little bit more about theory of mind, you can go to our podcast where I interviewed Dr. Sean Hurt, um, a therapist here in the Atlanta area who also was um, neurodivergent trained and aware. And so the whole concept of theory of mind, you can go there to get a little bit more information. And I will put that link down in the show notes. But let's talk then about theory of mind and the double empathy issue. So Milton said, um, what his research indicated is between an autistic and a non-autistic partner, what exists is the double empathy issue. So this means that um, the challenge doesn't solely exist within the person who is neurodivergent that when you have an autistic individual and a non-autistic individual in a relationship or communicating or sharing hurts and feelings and processes, um, there's going to be some empathy issues, meaning the ability to see it from your perspective or to see it from your lens or to be looking at it from your shoes, right? Because a neurotypical has a neurotypical lived experience and someone who's neurodivergent has a neurodivergent lived experience. Now, there are some who Dr. Atwood calls super NTs, um, which do have that ability. Um, and usually these are people in health health and helping fields, um, teachers, nurses, counselors, you know, ministers, those who kind of have their ministry and life based on helping and reaching the potential of other social workers included. But what can increase the challenges is when you're having these discussions, um, the person who is neurodivergent, the person who is neurotypical, they have this uh, double empathy, not being able to see from each other's perspective. So not always being able to empathize and, and sometimes give grace or um, to believe the other person's perspective. So from the person who is neurotypical, maybe that is that the person who is neurodivergent who has lower need for affect and lower need for connection, lower need for intimacy, um, not seeing that that is difficult when you are a person who is wired differently for more relationship, more sharing, more conversation, and your idea of connection or um, being intimate has nothing to do with conversation. So sometimes not like that's a, not a need I have. So I don't know how to really um, emotionally support or give support for that need because I simply don't have that need. Dan and I will be sharing a little bit about that in a podcast coming up called Hindsight Learning from the Journey. And Dan explains that. He said, I don't know how to feel that way if I've never felt that way before. If I've had something in my life that I can um, draw from that's kind of similar, I can. But if I've never felt or experienced that before, then that's, that's a difficulty. All right. So that might be 
an empathy problem from the neurodivergent person to the neurotypical problem, um, where there might be empathy from the neurotypical um, perspective and not really being able to have adequate empathy for the person on the spectrum is if you have a processing that is different and you are you process at a higher speed, um, you can process many things at one time, you can have multiple conversations, um, other people's emotions don't overwhelm you or flood you. So then maybe you don't understand what it's like when someone is having a heightened emotion, what that's like to feel um, flooded or um, struggling to process when there's too much information coming at one time, because that's something that comes natural to you. So it's difficult. You don't understand why it would take so much effort or why we can only talk about one thing at a time or why we need to slow down processing. I think for Dan and I, where we really saw this and where something kind of clicked is one of my um, deficiencies is I have um, issues with spatial recognition. I get lost a lot. I have problems with geography, north, south, east, and west, getting where I need to go. And I have some depth perception issues. And so um, we were having a conversation several years ago and Dan in frustration to me said, I don't understand someone with how intelligent you are and how many degrees that you have. I just don't understand why you can't get from point A to point B. Because for Dan, one of his strengths and one of his skill sets is I don't know how he does it, but he can look up in the sky and determine where north, south, east, and west is, which is crazy to me. I don't even know how a person can do that. He always knows where he is ge geographically, at least, not in time and space all the time, but geographically, I mean, in almost 29 years of marriage, maybe we've gotten lost three or four times where he had to stop and get directions, but he's always been adept at um, a compass, map, knowing where we are, knowing how to get there, memorizing maps, even when we have been abroad, um, even if he doesn't understand the language, like when we were in France, he still, you know, he said, well, the word is still spelled this way. You still look for this road that has this spelling. It doesn't matter if you understand what the, what that means in French, um, you just need to know where to go and how the Metro works. And he could figure out the Metro, figure out the tube. You can always figure those things out. And that is just not a skill that I have. In fact, I, I get lost all the time. So it was kind of in that moment of kind of his frustration towards me. I was like, you know, it's kind of the same thing. I process emotions and faces and remember faces. And my skill set is um, certain things emotionally and relationally. And, you know, sometimes I get frustrated with you because why can't you do that? Like I do that. This comes so easily for me. And I would say the same thing to you. You're so intelligent. You have a higher IQ than I do. I don't understand why you just can't get what this thing is that's simple to me. And so when he kind of made that comment to me about, you know, when I get lost, I don't know where I am um, geographically. Um, he would be frustrated with me if I called him at work because I was again lost. Thank goodness for GPS and cars um, that have systems in them now, but that didn't exist two decades ago. Um, that what really started to begin to, for us to begin to understand each other. What comes easily for one person may not come easily for the other person. So that's what we're kind of talking about when we're talking about the double empathy problem. So having compassion and having kindness for the other person. So what that might look like if you're a neurodivergent person and you don't have as much need for connection or intimacy or you, um, your um, spouse is, says they need more connection or something that you said hurt them, hurt their feelings, um, you don't necessarily have to understand the why to understand that if this person says this is hurting me or if this is something that I need rather than um, dismiss it or say, well, too bad you have that need or you use emotional logic and I use real logic or, you know, versus, versus dismissing that, learning how to lean in and what are ways you can provide for that need. If you're the neurotypical spouse and you're, you know, constantly frustrated, you know, I shouldn't have to say this more than once. I shouldn't have to remind this person. I shouldn't have to break it down into so many steps. Um, well, what are we after, short-term or long-term here? So um, if you're wanting to do have communication when we need to make sure it's clear, we need to make sure expectations um, have been communicated properly. And then if there are memory issues, which could be a part, um, legitimate concern for those who are on the spectrum, then we have to figure out an accommodation. And if you want to have, again, a relationship, then that means what do we need to do? Do we need to write this thing down? Do we need, need to make a notebook? Do we need to have a whiteboard, a cork board, um, timers or things that go off in the phone? We've got to learn to work together as a team instead of the mindset of I shouldn't have to, 
we need to work each other to say, what can, what can I do that helps or supports you? Even if I don't understand or don't have that need, how do we work together so that each of us have um, something that is meaningful in the relationship? So there should be a lot of compromise in the relationship. Now, compromise can be a big issue in neurodiverse marriages. I invite you to listen to the podcast that is coming up with my guest, Abby, who is the author of The Autism Impact on Marriage. And she has a lot to say about compromise and sometimes what she calls the tyranny of rules living in an ASD marriage. So that brings us to social communication. We know that social communication is a big issue in neurodiverse marriages. Now, there's a Cambridge study that showed, I don't know, first of all, let me kind of take you back to the old game of telephone. Um, Back in the day, the game of telephone or some people called it rumors. Um, One person stood over here and started a rumor or started something. And then there's six or seven people. And by the time you got to the last person, usually it was not transmitted all the way down to the last person, exactly the same. So um, what this Cambridge study showed is that when two neurodivergent individuals are talking to each other, or when two neurotypical individuals are talking to each other, that, that is when there is a higher, more effective um, transmission of information that is more accurate and more clear, all right? Because one brain type talking to someone else of the same brain type, if the informational is transactional. Now, what the uh, study did not look at is what if that information is emotional, social, and relational. But as far as factual and transactional, there was more effective communication neurodivergent to neurodivergent and neurotypical to neurotypical. Um, the transaction, the efficiency slowed down when it was neurotypical and neurodivergent. And so what that tells us that we have to look at is different styles of communication. Again, um, learning to process. If you'll watch part two in a YouTube video, um, some advice from AS individuals to neurotypical individuals about what is needed in communication, um, that uh, YouTube will be out next week. But um, we have to slow down our communication. We need to understand that there's going to be some just differences in a mixed neurology type relationship. So we slow down and we work together versus the two extremes that I see, which is neurotypical perspective is always right unless you can do it the neurotypical way. It's never going to be okay. And then the other extreme is, well, I'm on the spectrum and you just always need to accommodate and do it my way because I'm the one on the spectrum. Neither one of those approaches are going to work. It's going to be a team approach that's going to work. So I invite you to listen to some of the upcoming podcasts. Um, Again, Abby and the Autism um, Impact on Marriage. And we'll also be interviewing Dr. Wilder again, who will um, bring us back to living from the heart. I didn't get to that. um, But what I really wanted to talk about in here was the orbital prefrontal cortex. Um, I'll get to that in a later segment, because I also, in this book, he talks about fear bonds and love bonds. And you won't really be able to work on your relationship bonds if it's primarily based on fear. So um, an upcoming segment, we'll talk about fear bonds and love bonds.